All right, well, if you have a Bible, grab them, open them to the book of James. That's where we're going to be starting. That's where we're going to be going for the next several weeks. Uh, maybe for those of you who aren't great with your sword drills, if you got one of our Bibles, it's on page 1233. 1233, the book of James. Um, now, when we get into the book of James, I want to take a minute and kind of do an overview uh, of the book before we actually dive into uh, what he's written here, just because I think that will really help shape what we hear and what we read throughout this book. It's going to help us uh, view it in a certain way. And so the book of James is actually the oldest book in the New Testament. So I know it comes towards the end of your New Testament, but most scholars believe that the book of James was the first New Testament book that was written somewhere around 10 to 15 years after the death of Christ. James comes along and he writes this book. So uh, newsflash, if you're not aware of this, the New Testament, even the Old Testament as well for that matter, they are not in chronological order necessarily. Some books are, but not all of them. So James is actually the first letter, the first part of the New Testament that was written, at least according to most historians and scholars believe that. And so who was James? The guy that wrote this book, it's self-titled. He names himself in the verse one that he is James. And so James, there are a few James, a few different Jameses in scripture, but this would be uh, the half-brother of Jesus. And so we say half-brother because we know Jesus was born of Mary, of the Virgin Mary. And so he didn't have an earthly father. The Holy Spirit conceived in Mary, and she gave birth. And so Mary went on to have other children. We read about them in in the New Testament. So we know she had more children. And so we would say Jesus had half brothers and sisters, presumably. And so this is the half brother of Jesus. Now I want you all to stop and think for just a minute, especially you that have siblings. Some of you have a bunch of siblings. Um, Think of how difficult it must be to have someone so perfect as a brother. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I know I had a brother. I had two brothers, one two years older, one two years younger. And the one that was two years older than me, he never seemed to get in trouble quite like I did. I mean, if you take away the time he blew up mom and dad's house, other than that story, uh, He just never seemed to really get grounded and be in tons of trouble. He made pretty good grades. I was constantly getting in trouble for all these things. And it kind of makes you view them differently when it seems like they just seem to be much more perfect than you are. And so if you think of maybe not even a brother but a friend you have, maybe somebody at school or whoever it may be that just seems like perfect, never get in trouble, and you think of how you view them, now imagine if your brother was like, God, right? That's what James is dealing with. His brother is God the Son, is Jesus Christ, never sinned in his life, was not just claimed to be, not just like, well, my brother, my sister's a goody two-shoes, like legit the only person who's ever lived who never committed sin. That's who James grew up with, with Jesus. It must have been incredibly difficult for James, rewarding in so many ways, but on the same On the same token, difficult in many ways. And so James did not believe what his brother said. James did not believe his brother was the son of God. He didn't believe it. He didn't buy it. If you look in John chapter 7, y'all don't have to turn there. We've got uh, our passages will be on screen. John chapter 7, listen to what happens as Jesus is going about and teaching and healing people. It says, verses 1 through 5, After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now what they're basically saying, his brother's, saying is, okay, you really can do what you're saying to do, all these tricks you're doing, you really are who you say you are, just go broadcast it to everyone, why don't you get on out there, go do it, show yourself to the whole world, but look what it says in verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him, not even the very brothers of Jesus believed in Jesus at that time, 
And then in Mark chapter 3, I've always thought this was just a, a very telling passage. Mark chapter 3, verse 21, Jesus once again is going about healing people and uh, casting out demons in the verses leading up to it. And then verse 21 says, And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. His family didn't just not believe in him, but they thought Jesus was crazy. They thought he was a lunatic, that he lost his mind. They were going to rescue him and say, we've got to save you from yourself because you, you've literally lost it. That's who we have authoring this book and this letter. That's who wrote the first New Testament book. So what changed? What happened in the life of James that made him go from someone who thought his brother was a crazy person to writing the first book in the New Testament and, by the way, went on to die and be martyred for his faith? Because of his faith in Christ, he willingly died. What changed in his life? And it was the resurrection. It was the resurrection. Jesus died, was beaten, was buried for three days, and then he rose from the grave. And look what it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, For I have delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. In verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. He came back from the dead and visited James. And James is convinced. Acts chapter 1 also lays out that he met with James in the upper room. And so we know that the resurrected Christ came and James had an encounter with him. And once he encountered him, it radically changed his life from that point forward. It changed his life. And so he writes this letter, and, and who James is as a person, it changed him so much so when he realized that his brother truly was the Messiah that he became probably, you could easily argue, the most dominant figure in the New Testament. Now I know if we start thinking who the big dogs are in the New Testament, probably most people are going to say one of two names, Paul or Peter, one of those two, right? Peter's the one with the big mouth. Peter's the one that's constantly saying everything. He's always listed first when they list the disciples. Every single time in the New Testament, they list the disciples. Peter is first. He's a spokesperson, basically, for the group. And then, of course, the Apostle Paul, right? Penned 13 letters. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. We think big figure, dominant figure. But when the Jerusalem Council broke out, so what the Jerusalem Council was, was the early church in the New Testament. There was some controversy over well, the Jews say we do this in worship, but now there are these new Christians come along and they're saying we don't have to follow this tradition. What do we really have to do? Like, they're trying to get some shape and order. You know who the early church went to? Not Paul and not Peter. They went to James because James was the one who laid the hammer down, so to speak. He was the one that spoke and brought clarity for the church and gave direction for it. Not Peter, not Paul. So he's a dominant figure. And he writes this letter, which is short, five chapters. It's a short book, the book of James. You can go home, and in under 20 minutes, you can read the entire book of James. It shouldn't take you, unless you're really slow, it shouldn't take you more than 15 minutes to read the entire book of James. And just in that short book, he's got 54 imperatives. 54. In other words, 54 times he tells you, do this. You should do this. James is all about do this and do that. He's not one that just talks through things. He's kind of like we might say a go-getter. James is all about being very practical. That's why we've named this series Practical Faith. He tries to explain our faith and give us commands that are practical, things we can do. And it's such a practical book, there is no way you can read the book of James and truly try and understand it and study it without it having some big change in your life. There's no way. He covers way too much and gives way too many commands to just simply read it and then put it away. It's going to change the way we live our lives if we truly try and apply it. And so, look at verse 1. Let's get into the text. Verse 1, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. So this is the opening. James identifies who he is, James, but notice how he refers to himself. He says, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he identifies himself as a servant. Now, the word there is the word doulos, which actually is more accurately translated slave. So he's saying that he's identifying as a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So think about what we went over just now. You've got someone who we just read a couple passages about how he thought his brother was crazy, was a lunatic, did not believe in him, and now he's saying, I'm his slave. The transformation was radical in James' life. He went from being a skeptic to a slave. He went from being someone who didn't believe in his brother to someone who would give his life for his brother as a slave and then quite literally as he was martyred for his faith. So he identifies himself as a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so once he thought it was crazy, now he's a slave. But he says he's written this letter to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. And so what is this? Well, if you think back in your Old Testament, you know uh, Israel is made up of 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so this is kind of you symbolically to refer to the Jews, all of the Jews. And then he says in the dispersion. So what is the dispersion? I think this is another one of those key things. We need to know who exactly he's writing this to because it will help shape the way we hear the message in verses 2 through 4. The dispersion. If we were to go back to the book of Acts, um, if you go back all the way to chapter 6, you'll see how they were doing things. Uh, during that time, the New Testament church had just started. Thousands of people came to put their faith in Christ. And so they're there, they're worshiping. And he's doing signs and wonders. There's a guy named Stephen comes along. Stephen's doing these signs and wonders. Then in Acts chapter 7, we see how, how the high priest, he, uh, Stephen gets brought before the high priest and questions saying, and they made false accusations against Stephen, saying, this guy's blaspheming God. He's blasphemous. He needs to be executed. And so they bring him before the high priest, and Stephen has a chance, an opportunity to kind of speak. And he goes all through chapter 7, laying out the Old Testament, saying, God gave this covenant to Abraham, to Moses. And he walks through kind of a, a storyline of the Old Testament to the high priest, mind you. And then towards the end, he says, but yet Israel disobeyed God, rejected him, and killed the prophets. And then he looks at the high priest and says, you are that wicked person. You're doing the same thing now. You have murdered the very Messiah sent from God. You killed Jesus. It's you. You did it. And so their response, look at Acts chapter 7, towards the end, verse 54. It says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so Stephen is martyred. He's killed for his faith. We're going to tie this together here in just a second. Stephen, early church, preaching the word, killed for his faith. And notice what it said there. They laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. That would be Saul of Tarsus, who we would more commonly know as Paul, the Apostle Paul, who also had a life-changing encounter with the resurrected Christ that led to him authoring 13 books in the New Testament. But Stephen is killed for his faith, and in Acts chapter 8, look at verses 1 through 3. It says, And Saul approved of his execution. And there, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. 
So, when we read this letter that James has written, one, we're talking about the half-brother of Jesus who didn't even believe in him and now is willing to give his life for him, and he's writing to a group of people who were scattered because Paul, or Saul, and the Jews back then were ravaging the church, dragging off men and women, putting them in prison, some of them being stoned and killed for their faith. That's the people he's writing to. Did you catch what we said in that text? They were scattered throughout all the land. It says here, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. That's these people that were dispersed. That's where we get the phrase dispersion. They were dispersed throughout the land because of severe persecution. So the very people James is writing to are a people who are hurting, who have probably lost loved ones because of their faith. They're people who are having to get a restart in life in some foreign land. That's the people he's writing to. It's not this nice little fun type community. It's hurting people who are being persecuted that he's writing to. Keep that in mind. So, jumping into our text, verse 2. Let's read 2 through 4. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So, James looks at this hurting group of people and he tells us to count it all joy when we encounter these trials. And so he doesn't just leave it at trials. I love the fact that James is actually, I think, intentionally ambiguous. Like he's very vague intentionally. He says various kinds, trials of various kinds. So people always ask questions. Well, what is a trial you may go through in life? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's a big test that you're worried to death about passing. Maybe that's a big trial for you. Maybe it's a a friendship that you have with someone that's kind of rocky. It's not going well for you, and it's causing you lots of stress. Maybe you're ill. Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's something at home life. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's a job for adults. I mean, it could be any sort of thing. All of those things fit under the umbrella of a trial of a various kind. That's the whole point in using that word various. Doesn't matter. You're facing difficult trials. What does James tell us to do? Count it joy. Now think about the trials they would have been facing. And remember what we read in Acts chapter 8. They were dragging them off, ravaging the church, dragging men and women off, throwing them in prison. Some of them were even being killed. To those people, he said, count it joy when you encounter these trials. Now, it does seem like polar opposite of what we should, how we should respond to a trials that we face. I get it. I feel you. And I think one of the worst things you could do as a believer is when you meet someone going through a difficult trial is tell them, hey, the most common phrase, God's got a plan. He's going to work it out. I can remember talking to people who have lost their very own children and told me, every time somebody told me that, I wanted to punch them in the mouth. Don't tell me God has a plan. I'm hurting. And the best thing that we can do when people are hurting and they're in a trial is not trying to reason with them through some theological point, but it's to go cry with them. Go hug them. Go meet them in their pain. We even see examples of that in Scripture. When you if we go back to John, the Gospel of John, there's a story about a guy named Lazarus. And when we see what happened with Lazarus, his sisters are there, Mary and Martha, and Lazarus is sick. And he becomes really sick and to the point where he passes away. He's dead. And they're like, where is Jesus? They call for Jesus. Where's he at? It took him days. Jesus finally gets there. And what did Jesus do? I've got a plan. Don't worry about it. No. Jesus goes to them, consoles them, comforts them. And then the shortest verse in all scripture, it says, Jesus wept. He cried. You don't think God knew? You don't think God the Son knew what was going to happen right afterward? Because he did end up raising Lazarus from the dead, but not until he comforted those who were hurting. When we find ourselves going through trials, the best thing we can do as Christians is comfort one another. Because if you're not the one going through a trial, chances are you can more easily see how you could find joy. 
And so he tells us to find joy when we encounter these trials. How do we do that? How do you go about finding joy? Look at the the, the next phrase in there. When you meet trials of various kinds, verse 3, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. We want steadfastness. And so I can find joy when I go through a trial because I know it's going to give me steadfastness. Sounds like somewhat of a reason, I guess, right? Steadfastness, another way you could translate that, it gives you endurance, stamina. It gives you the ability to continue on and keep going, keep going, keep going. And so what does all of this mean? mean? Why do we need endurance? It still doesn't quite get to the root of the question. Why do I need, why do I, why do I want to find joy in a trial? Because it gives me endurance. Why do I need this endurance? Why do I, why, how about just not have a trial? Well, look what he says next. Verse four says, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Think about what it said. Let steadfastness or stamina, or endurance that you build up, let that have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. What is perfect and complete? What is it looking for? I would sum it up in this way. Spiritual maturity. Let you mature fully. It will let you grow and mature fully if you can have joy in trials because they will give you the endurance to reach full maturity. As a Christian, when we think about our lives, we're constantly going and growing. We should be. Our command is to be made more and more to the image of Christ as we go through life. We used to tell teenagers, we used to tell, tell them regularly, look back on your life one year ago today. Are you closer to Christ now than you were one year ago? If you're not, something is wrong. You need to change your habits you need to change what you're doing, your priorities. Something needs to change because we should constantly be growing more and more into the image of Christ. That is our goal in life, to mature. Even just thinking physically, you're teenagers, you're growing. I remember one that was here just a couple days ago on Sunday night, and I had to hold it in from giggling because I kept listening to the voice cracking and popping. I'm thinking, they're growing, they're maturing. That's part of teenage years. You're not going to act the same way. Look, it's amazing. I'm always amazed how different teenagers are their last year of youth ministry versus on their, and compared to their second year of college ministry, when they're of that age. I led college ministry for years at First Baptist Central, and I would look at those students who were like 19 and a half years old, and they would look down their nose at those youth like, oh my gosh, that's so silly. I can't believe I used to do that or say that or act like that or dress like this or do they look at them as if it's silly and you're thinking and you're 19 like wait till you're 29 or 39 or 49 that's life we steady grow and mature it's no different in our spiritual walk we should steady be trying to grow more and more into the image of christ and so we need these struggles to get toughness and strength think if you never fell off a bike Think if you never scraped your knee, you would never learn how to have good balance. It's through the difficulties we face that we learn how to do things and how to cope and how to get by in life. We run the risk of thinking, when we think about maturity, uh, that, that our goal in life is something different. That it's school, spouse, work, house, all of these things, but as Christians... We should keep in mind that our whole purpose in life is to be made more and more into the image of Christ. We should be discipling others, and we should be being discipled ourselves. That process, the word we use is sanctification. It means you're being sanctified throughout your whole life. You're steady growing. And so if you're not a Christian, that's all you have hope in, the here and the now. Whatever happens, this is all I have on this before I die. This is it. This is it. And so when a trial comes, it's impossible to find joy in it because there is nothing else. But as believers, we know our ultimate goal is to be more like Christ. There, therefore, when we face these trials, we know it's making us stronger, giving us endurance so that we can get closer and closer to spiritual maturity. I'm reminded 
I know I've alluded to this before, but several years ago, we're going to the beach. Um, we're on our way to the beach. Miss Rachel had worked the night before, so she was tired. She's sleeping next to me. The kids were all in the back. And I don't know, a couple hours down the road heading to the beach. And my mother-in-law called me. And my phone rang. And so I answered it. And when I answered it, she just said two words that really changed our lives. She said, Mark's dead. Her husband, her spouse, my father-in-law, right here in Copper Mill Subdivision, just dropped. Pretty healthy young man and just dropped, had a heart attack. And I can remember in that moment thinking, what? Questioning. Did I, did I hear you right? Like, we're going on vacation. Like, we're ready to go to the beach and have fun. What, what? I don't, this can't be right. Can't be true. And then 18 months later, to the day, on January the 6th, I'm at work. Before I was full-time in ministry, and Miss Rachel called me. And I stepped outside the shop and answered the phone in similar two words. Jordan is dead. Her brother. 30 years old. And it shocked us. We heard from it. And I can remember thinking about James and thinking, how do you count it joy when you go through these difficult times? I know it makes you stronger. I know all that. I know the right verses. I know the words that are there. I get it. I've read it. I've taught teenagers on it. But now it's real life. How do you find joy in those difficult times. And for me personally, I get to thinking through, through those days when all that was happening. And I think about how much, now that as I look back and I say, okay, let's just try and think of this in a plain, simple way. They're both far better off than they were, right? We hated to lose them early. But both of them are far better off than they were now. And then I think about the change it's had on me because my brother-in-law had struggles that I don't have. He struggled with things, and I was very hard on him, very hard on him. How can you claim to be a Christian and struggle with this? That was my attitude towards him, and God used this to break my heart of that and to say, you need to learn how to be gracious when people have struggles. You need to learn how to have sympathy with them and for them. And how much has changed how I interact with other people after all of that has happened. And I say, man, okay, so let me think through this. They're both far better off now. They're not fighting through the struggles of this life. They're in the presence of God. Like, they're the ones looking down at me saying, moron, you're the one that's got to get up at 5.30 in the morning. You're the one who's going to have to get up in the middle of the night, take care of a crying baby. Like, don't feel bad for me. You're the one that's got to Get up and go to work. You're the one that's got to sit in traffic. has got to worry about paying bills and taxes. They're far better off, and I'm better off as well for the lessons that I've learned and the toughness, the maturity, the spiritual maturity that's come through going through these things and coping through them. And I can't speak on behalf of everyone in every trial because there are no doubt people in this room that either have gone through or, or are in the middle of a trial that is real, it's serious, it hurts. And it doesn't have to be something massive. Miss Rachel used to use the phrase all the time, suffering is relative. To some people, certain things mean a whole lot. And they can really be hurting. Don't belittle someone else's trial, but look for ways you can comfort them and help them to find joy throughout that. I don't know why everyone goes through every trial they go through, but listen to a few of these verses. Jeremiah, y'all know this one, 2911. Jeremiah 2911. Listen, I know we'd like to think this. That verse, believe it or not, was not intended for every single senior in high school. Like, that was not the purpose of it. That's how it's used now. It's on stickers and shirts, and it's all over the place. But it is written to a specific people back in the Old Testament. However, the promises of that verse, they do clue us into the character of God, and that character of God still rings true for us today, just like it did for his people in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. 
He knows the plans He has for us. It says for welfare, not for evil. He's not trying to do evil to us by going through trials. He has plans for future and hope. Think about Isaiah 55, 9. It says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. His ways are higher than ours. We can't even wrap our minds around what he's doing. Look, I'm struggling to keep a house together. I've got a job. I've got a wife who's got a job. We have four kids. One's in diapers and one's playing high school sports. We've got them spread all over, trying to get them to and from practice and schools. We've got two different schools, three different sports teams. We've got all kind of stuff going, and I'm struggling just to get by day to day with that. How crazy is it to think that I have the ability to know the mind of God who keeps the whole universe flowing and held together? It's ridiculous. And so trust in God. His ways are higher than the earth. His ways are higher than your ways. Psalm 77, 19 says, Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. Even when you don't see God's hand at work, even when you struggle to wrap your mind around what he's doing, why he's doing it, he's there. Nothing happens out of his control that he doesn't have the ability to control. And so I can't know for certain why different trials happen to different ones of us, but when we meet these trials of various kinds, it tests our faith. Keep in mind what a test is. Y'all are in school. You take tests. A test is there to reveal what you know. It's there to reveal something about you. We'll talk more about this next week, but don't confuse it with temptation. A little spoiler alert, it's the same exact word in Greek. Context is the only reason we translate it differently. It's only one word for test or tempt. But when we use it in our English language, if I'm tempting you, that means my goal is to make you do something wrong. If I'm testing you, I want to reveal that you have the knowledge to answer this question, to get something right. That's the joke. Contrary to popular belief, I promise your teachers are not evil. Their goal is not to see you fail in school. They test you because they've already invested in you and teaching you. And now they want to reveal that you've learned this. That's why they test you. The same thing with our faith. When we go through these trials, we're being tested so it can reveal that we have gained that spiritual maturity and Christ likeness to where we can endure through it and that we are more like Christ. Even when you can't see, like we read in Psalm 77, it may very well be that the reason you go through this trial is not even for your own self, but so that you can help someone else who may not otherwise be able to get through their difficulty. It could simply be a matter of experience. I need you, God could be saying, I need you to be mature enough and established in your faith enough because one day, it may be 10 years, 20 years, 50 years down the road, you're going to have someone who's really hurting and without you, they're not going to be able to make it. So I need you to go through this for their betterment. I don't know why we go through what trials we go through, but I know what James says is true. We are to count it all joy because we trust God for who he is, and we know that God is for us, not against us. He plans to do us good, not evil. And if we keep our eyes fixed on him and remember that the ultimate goal is not houses and cars and relationships, but it's being more like Christ, we can see how we can use the trials life throws our way to grow us in spiritual maturity. That's how we can count it all joy. Let's pray.